Um, so I will keep a, a look on the on the room if anybody else tries to join. Um, but uh, if not, you know, you will be my VIP guest for for this session, uh, and I'm happy to take uh, your questions. Um, the presentation will be in two parts, which is one introductory, um, uh, like uh, like showing the context. Um, giving an introduction about the concepts I'm speaking about. Uh, and then we have the second part, which is actually an approach to practical implementations. Uh, we tried this out in a certain context, but it's uh, like very early days. Um, so we need more places where we can try out those new governance structures and governance forms um, to uh, uh, mature them further. Some of the aspects we are using are pretty old, um, but on the other hand, we are now trying to combine them with technology. So let's right, uh, dive right in. Hi, Chris, welcome. Um, so the, the challenge we are having today is that we are facing uh, a world which is increasingly complex. Uh, we are facing more and more challenges uh, we need to uh, um, react to, and the amount of existential risks and risks uh, which are mounting to be solved is just increasing. Uh, so one of the things we really need to do is we need to find ways uh, to handle increasing complexity. And in this increasing complexity, we need to find new ways um, of making uh, good decisions. So for, for this, we need to rethink the why, how we make decisions. Um, I believe that, give me a second, I have a little bit of connectivity issue here. Um, I will close another window in the hope that this will maybe ease a little bit uh, the load on my computer and hopefully like resolve the problem. Sorry for the interruption. I'm back right now. So can you see my screen again? Wonderful. So uh, the challenge is that we need to make better decisions, faster decisions with more data. Um, when we look at ex exponential growth, which is uh, pretty much what we are having as a civilization, uh, then it's pretty clear that exponential growth is not sustainable. It doesn't mean that we cannot uh, continue to develop our species in a successful way, but it means uh, that we need phase shifts. We need ways of drastically changing the way how we interact with our environment uh, to allow for successful uh, adoption to our environment. And this is the same what we see with a child which comes off of the womb of the mother, because when it changes its internal growth dynamics to a, a new way of interacting with the world, so being, being breastfed, starting to breathe on its own, um, starting to uh, not be directly uh, um, connected to the mom, uh, but uh, grow outside the mother to be able to accommodate uh, for this exponential growth of cells, which is ongoing. The same thing is what we need to do when we think about our civilization. And for this phase shift, we need to rethink the why, how we organize and how we self-organize in organizations and uh, in business. And the quick question here is, can biological approaches teach us self-organization at scale? And uh, you, you guess what? I wouldn't speak about it if I wouldn't believe it. So I think that nature is actually quite good at it. Uh, and that we just need to listen and need to study nature uh, to adapt uh, to the same principles. Um, to speak further about what I want to uh, like share as a message, uh, we need to understand complex systems. Complex systems um, is, uh, are those systems which are composed out of many small elements which interact with each other. Um, and the complex aspect is when you have new um, aspects, new uh, attributes arising, uh, arising through the interaction of the small elements. You see that, for example, in uh, uh, ant colonies. Uh, when they build their colony, the colony is an emergent property out of the interaction of all ants. Um, complex systems have those emergent properties, but they have also the adaptation as an aspect, the feedback loops, um, and their nonlinear behavior. And I would like to highlight another aspect, which is adaptivity. 
adaptive organisms are able to respond to their environmental changes. So this is us as well as a species. We need to adopt our environmental changes. So we need to see how we can increase our adaptability, our ability to react in a sane way to our environment. Humans as complex adaptive systems are um, the focus area of my study, I would say. Um, and it becomes very interesting when you think about yourself as a complex adaptive system. Um, let me read out some lines which I want to share with you as a thought experiment. I am an emergence. Where is I? In which cell is I or you? I'm collaboration. I'm synergistic. I'm a complex system, millions of years old, a result of continuous evolution. We are not as old as we are when we are born. We are continuous evolution of our DNA and an embodiment of that lineage. Um, and we are complex adaptive systems. But which governance model are we using to be so successful in our adaption as a species, as human beings? Um, and how do we use those principles uh, to organize us on a higher level? So what's our governance model? Our governance model is one where we have collaborating sovereign cells, which lead to the emergence of collective cell intelligence, which is our collective intelligence. Our intelligence is a collective intelligence of our cells. And this principle applies if we want to take it one level higher. Collaborating sovereign humans leading to emergence of our collective intelligence. This is what we are striving for to be able to cope with magnitudes higher complexity. We see similar structures in similar scales uh, and they all relate to the same principles of life. So what we see with like the communication in between cells uh, and sovereign cells, this is what we need to uh, like um, uh, um, carry over to the different levels. We need to have strong sovereign individuals to have a strong uh, resilient community and trusted relationships. And if we want to build network societies uh, which are on a larger scale or like global network societies, which are able to uh, um, tackle existential risks, then we need to carry those concepts forth. We need strong and sovereign individuals which are able to make sense out of their environment to feed back into our communities the information we need to make uh, good judgments and to uh, um, find good solutions. The area where I'm coming from is field research over the last three years. Um, we coined the term distributed governance um, in the DGOV Foundation, uh, which was focused heavily in the blockchain space, in the distributed ledger space in the beginning, um, to research what can we do to distribute power. Because power distribution is as important in decentralization as the distribution of infrastructure if we want to create common services which are owned and in the hands uh, of the community. So we are looking for patterns. We try to discover patterns which lead for uh, the emergence of collective intelligence in human interaction. So those distributed governance systems we are researching, they have certain properties we see desirable and which are also very uh, attributable to complex adaptive systems in organisms, which is like we want to have participatory governance, which is like every cell is communicating with our body. Every person should have a voice and be able to participate in governance. It should be scalable in the sense that it's not only a cell bulk, but like a, a trillions of cells which form our body. It should be considerative, flexible, collaborative, interconnected, self-organizing so that we don't have single point of failures or risk, cognitive, diverse, emergent, adaptable, dynamic, and trustful. So those are the things we are striving for and which we would like to see in those systems. 
And we would like to ensure that every human being which has something to say, and especially when we think about existential risk, it becomes increasingly important, is heard. We need to ensure that those people which have something to say to help to save this planet, to save our species, to reduce risks, to find the best solution, that we hear them. We are currently not doing that with the institutions we have, and we are poorly in listening to the needs um, of like our planet and to the needs of like people or employees. It's something uh, usually organizations uh, and our organization structures are not really good at. So the challenge, how we make increasingly fast, uh, increase, uh, how we make wise decisions in increasingly fast and changing environments um, is by adopting new governance principles of distributed governance, uh, which are orientated on uh, complex adaptive systems on nature's principles. This was all very like, this was the abstract part, um, which I would like to, uh, which I wanted to share with you before going into the practical part. Um, so I will uh, shift over to my other presentation and would like to give you at this moment an opportunity to ask questions if there is something you would like to have clarified at this moment of the presentation. Are you all, ready, uh, all settled, ready to go for the next round? Yeah, um, the curious how to distribute power, which you might address. Yes, so distributed power, and I refer to it already, is like sovereign individuals and sovereign cells. So the smallest unit of power is the individual. And the way how we see the distribution of power happening is very similar like we see it in organisms. For example, you don't have a cell which has a superior power to another cell. There, there is no existence of this pattern. So when we speak about distributed governance functions and everything we are addressing here, uh, we assume uh, that we don't need power structures or hierarchies for those uh, coordination systems to function. They heavily rely on uh, um, easy rules of coordination between sovereign individuals, um, which means like birds which coordinate with each other while they're flying. So let's go into the practical aspect of it. The four different areas we have identified as absolutely crucial for those governance functions we need to research and expand on is the signaling, which means the ability to perceive your environment and to gather data. Um, in, uh, in the human context and in organization context, this means becoming aware of risks, becoming aware of um, potential needs um, and uh, with it being able to react to it. So the second part or the second area of governance functions we are looking into is sense making. So this means like the input you received uh, to weight it, to uh, give it a meaning to uh, um, in a very practical sense to propose a potential solution to it after doing the sense making um, uh, to move it over to the next step, which is like taking agency, taking action which is all about decision-making, the ability to identify what is the right proposal we need to move forward, and then uh, using that uh, decision um, to, uh, um, to allocate the resources you have to execute on it. Those are the like three main uh, governance structures areas, like governance function areas, uh, which need to work. And you can map this as a function to your existing departments in your organization to see actually where you have weak spots as well. Usually the decision-making works well, the signaling usually is poor, and the sense-making heavily depends on the qualification of the management and how they work with this stuff. This is how it usually is with hierarchies. And then we have like the fourth area, which is the reflection. So how are all the things moving forward? where is the state we have identified a problem and we made a proposal and we made a decision did we follow up on it did, can we close the topic down is it has it ended is the problem successfully resolved if this is not the case then the process needs to start over and also the reason why this was not the case needs to be addressed so this is the very very simple 
very basic and very general approach to uh, uh, start with an arbitrary coordination system for self-organization. And this model is oriented on the way how we understood complex adaptive systems to react to their environment. So we took those things and we put them into a process. So we chained it actually um, into each other. Um, and we are looking into uh, how we can mature it to develop software to allow for individuals in self-organization settings to directly use those frameworks. When we speak about governance functions, which are underlying in those different areas of signaling, sense-making, agency, and reflection, we're potentially speaking about thousands of different functions. Um, the big work which is lying ahead of us is simplifying those functions and finding the simplest of them, which are most general. So let's move through an example so you get a feeling uh, what this all is about. And I hopefully we have enough time in the end to potentially address one of your examples and uh, show how this works. So again, assuming you don't have a hierarchy, but still this is combinable with existing hierarchies. And we have done that in organizations to increase, uh, for example, um, transparency towards the management and the ability for uh, employees to signal their concerns. So let's start with the signaling. If we are, for example, imagine an, an organization with 150 people um, and uh, everybody is able to use their smartphone to create an issue. So this is what we, what we call the signaling, right? So you are able to raise your concerns. And those concerns could be, um, about, like, could be about anything. Um, for example, if you work in an organization um, and we take an emergency situation, there is fire in a room and there has no automatic, uh, been, uh, automatic fire detection. Somebody could use their phone, make a photo and uh, create an issue with like critical um, impact. When we speak about uh, impact, it's, it's actually uh, uh, how threatening is it to the context where you're in. In this case, the fire could like burn potentially down the whole office. If this is only one office building, it's uh, critical to the company to stop that fire as fast as possible. Uh, and another metrics we are looking at, how urgent is it? Um, so in this case, the fire is already burning, it comes out of the room. So the urgency of that is, is critical as well. So it's like in a very short time, there's a very large impact. To combine those things, they form uh, the function we call relevance. So impact plus urgency time-wise is forming relevance. Any issue which has relevance uh, as where, where, issue, uh, where, where those two parameters are both critical is obviously critical as well. And those informations are shared like broadcasts for all people which it is relevant for in the context. In this case, all members of this organization are notified there is a burning fire. Um, and others which are close by can confirm this. So this means we rely heavily on crowdsourcing issues and confirming them through crowd, um, through crowd verification. Very important here is that we don't um, look into uh, totally permissionless settings at the moment. So we believe that there is uh, either a merit system or a social uh, merit system in place, which means if I would uh, spread fake news about a uh, fire in the building, this would have heavily consequences for me as an employee for the organization doing such a false uh, alarm, right? So that, that would like stop me of doing it. In a, in a digital, completely permissionless setting, we need to think about how do we work with reputation there because the social trust graph is missing. So everybody is able to confirm issues which arise or decrease their relevance. Uh, so you're not directly influencing relevance, but you can say it's not that impactful time-wise, it's not that urgent. So those are the two options where you can react to. Obviously we go over into the sense-making. So the sense-making is where we propose how we react to a situation which was crowdsourced. Uh, and for example, in this case, uh, we have uh, obviously the situation evacuate the building, uh, right, uh, as a potential proposal, but this might be not necessary if it's such an urgent situation and there is an emergency protocol in place. 
um, then the proposing aspects uh, might be more organizational, right? So uh, it's not about the direct response because it's pretty clear if there's emergency protocol, how to react. It's more about the indirect response, but you could also do use it for direct response. But in this case, the proposing period will be very small because you need to come to an end of collecting the proposals uh, to make a decision. And in an emergency situation, this needs to go rather fast. So in this case, uh, we have different proposals, including in the, for example, an investigation of the fire where it came from, um, uh, potentially uh, uh, establishing um, like fire alarm centers everywhere in the building. That could be another proposal, but those would be more secondary proposals uh, as a consequence of this fire uh, and not so much directly primary proposals. If we go into the decision making, we see uh, like various forms of how you can reach consensus. You have various forms of how you can make decisions in an autocratic, hierarchically organized manner or into a weighted voting system. Um, or uh, you, you, can, you can use whatever you want. Uh, and we have seen like many opportunities uh, to do it differently in different contexts. Uh, and there is no that right answer. It really depends on which organization you're in. But the most important thing is that there is a way to make a decision. So after the proposal ends, there needs to be an opportunity to commit resources so that you're able to actually identify, can we move forward one, two, or three proposals with the fund and resources we have available? And do we need to move multiple ones forward or is it enough to move one forward? So this is all about commitment and all the things you're seeing here, they are all transparent for all participants. So they always see which issue is addressed, how and how the decision was formed, which is very, very important for the coordination between each other, because this is information required to navigate um, the, um, the organization, the, the self-organization. So we move over to the last um, area, which is reflection, which is, do we actually execute it on the proposal? Can we close it down? So what could happen is somebody uh, uh, now uh, feeds back um, the information that the decision which was made with the proposal which was included and the resources which were allocated was successfully allocated, uh, was successfully executed. It would be the easiest example. Um, and if multiple witnesses exist, they can all confirm that um, uh, this is this needs to be non anonymized because in this case again there needs to be a slashing mechanism for abuse and spam in an organizational structure. This would be just by your name and your social um, your social reputation, uh, which is sufficiently in all organizational structures usually where people know each other um, and work with each other. Um, so this means we are able to reflect on the issues which happened and close them down. And what you see in the whole process here, there is never the question, are you allowed to propose an issue? Are you allowed to uh, communicate a need? Are you allowed to propose a solution? Are you allowed, and this is like the most crucial thing, especially with traditional organizations, how do you make decisions? Who's allowed to make decisions? But in theory, you could do all the different steps in a totally permissionless way. So everybody who feels like he wants to engage can do that. Especially for step one and two, it's a great improvement for organizations while maintaining decision-making structures which are existing for step three. Um, while uh, reflection uh, is also, you could interpret it as signaling actually. So this is where we come back to as well. It's signaling on a different level, on a meta level, you, you, you spawn a subroutine, you could say. Uh, where you can signal again needs uh, and issues in relationship to decisions, right? Or in relationships to proposals. So the structure of this generalized framework allows it to be nested in higher and lower hierarchies. Um, so this is, this is the one example which I wanted to share and I will make a very short one, a second one, uh, just to, for you to get a feeling. After the room is burned out, somebody creates a new issue, which is actually we need to replace the service which burned out. And the issue is uh, maybe a high, um, has a high relevance, 
uh, because we are not able to access a certain service. Then there would be a proposal to potentially put that load on a different server cluster, which was not in that room, or and to replace it, or and to put it into a cloud service. Then there would be the decision to make that or to execute on that with the resources available. And then there would be a feedback if this was sufficient to resolve the issue. So you see uh, it's just a consequence out of the first issue that there was a second one created, which was related to that event. Um, but this is arbitrary how much you can create there. Um, if you want to read more about it, uh, self-organization to work, there's way more to it than the system itself. There is something which we call like subsystems. So we see humans as subsystems, as complex adaptive systems, which are in themselves are inconsistent. We don't think about them as rational beings. We think about them as complex systems, which means that their belief systems heavily uh, influence if collaborative, for example, behavior is present or not. If you want to read about that, I wrote a, a longer, hard to read article because it's very dense and very demanding, um, which is the seven beliefs for collective civilization, which goes all about, uh, all in about belief systems required for self-organization. Um, if you want to follow other research in this direction regarding DAOs and distributed governance, there is this DAO, uh, DGOF Foundation network, where a lot of experts are present for pioneering this space. If you have ideas or questions, we can address them now. If you want to follow me, you can do via Twitter. I would love to use the remaining two minutes to uh, gather questions and feel free to shoot them out to me via email uh, so I can address them uh, in a separate session with you. Um, but I would love to hear your feedback and your questions now. Hey Tim, this sounds very interesting. Uh, as far as um, uh, building or, or I don't know, putting together proofs of concept, have you done? It looks like you've got. You said bullet point one. You've got some pilot projects that you put together. Yeah, we we did implement uh, signaling and proposing um, in agile teams in this way. Um, to allow for uh, for getting more input in a traditional uh, governmental organization in Germany, um, uh, it's um, but we would love to see more, and we would love to see it in other environments which are even more agile. You know, they say they do agile, but um, the mindset is heavily dependent. So we are looking for more pilot opportunities. And in some parts of this, I, I imagine it could be automated decisions could be made by computers yeah. uh, for sure uh, it always depends on like which information you have available we see a, a huge decree for computer assistive work in those concepts for discovery of issues for mapping if the same issue was reached like raised before for uh, supporting and advising for potential decisions based on the crowdsource information um, so we see computer systems always as assistant systems in those contexts. Uh, we usually don't see them as, as the decision makers uh, for, for the risks which are involved with that. Yeah. Uh, is this at all related to turning um, the laws into code, if you will, whatever the laws of that area are? Uh, turning those into code and so whatever decisions are made you make sure they're within certain boundaries i guess that, that yeah that's the reason why we don't want to see decisions being made by the computer systems but um you crowdsource which decisions are um are selected by the individuals so we see the code as an infrastructure element uh, as a coordinating element as an element which re reduces transaction costs between individuals, uh, but less as a replacement for it. So the capability of humans to make sense and to make uh, sound decisions is way superior to like algorithms um, uh, if they are half the information available which they need to make those decisions. Mm. 
Um, I, maybe like to your discussion here with Chris as well, like uh, I shared a, a paper that uh, I've contributed towards um, for code as law um, and uh, like basically looking at what had happened in the blockchain space. So um, yeah, definitely love to dive in deeper with you all on this. For sure. One question. I think uh, the room is no show. Does it mean at room one that we can use the room longer? Uh, thank you for sharing that uh, article, uh, Vienna. Uh, I would. I will. I will read it. Feel free to read our via email as well to uh, um, if you want to continue that conversation. And the same for you, Chris. Right, it's like uh, now very limited time opportunity to like really exchange um, more information. Uh, but also regarding the code as law, I think what we can set is like the rules of a framework, how we self-organize. And in this sense, yes, um, the, the, the law is setting the boundaries of our ways, how we engage with each other, right? Yeah. Okay. I think I'm definitely for what you have advocated, like a more human-centric approach. Um, at the same time, I feel like there's a lot of things we don't yet know in complex systems. Um, yes. So, and also like for me, like I also care about the transition from where we are to that system. Um, and I'm particularly for now looking at climate change, like how to use like um, what you are talking about for climate change, which is what I'm focusing on for the past and next few years. Yes, I think we can crowdsource. Like the first thing which we should do is building a platform to crowdsource existential risks in relationship to climate change. Um, and, and for that, I think the signaling is the first thing we need to master anyway, like as a function uh, before going into the other areas. Um, and I think there is no reason why not to actively work on it if there is any opportunity to do that in a project where there is funding to pay for the development work which is required. I think this is something which definitely needs to happen because we need to actually get an overview and an understanding what are the most pressing issues where we can make the most impact uh, to save ecosystems uh, and the environment. Um, so yeah. I, I would love to, if you have any ideas, it would be very interesting to, to use that opportunity to crowdsource um, the, the relevance of the different issues we are having. There's a lot more topics to deep dive into. So yeah, <laughs> of course. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, everybody. Are there more questions? Because we are not in a rush uh, as the room is free for the next 25 minutes. Uh, I'm just thinking through this this idea and trying to imagine all the angles a little bit. Like, you know, on one hand, there is uh, this is just going to improve whatever we've already got. It's going to like uh, put infrastructure around it so that people are more engaged or more informed or uh, more participatory with the way they're governed. On the other hand. It might be saying, uh, well, no, there's, there's a whole new way we could do all this. But we might not need as much of the traditional governing structure. It could be more distributed. And so I'm trying to imagine, how do you get there from here? I guess the tactic you're, you're pursuing is you're talking to the government as they are and saying, how can I help? What, what, how would this help you guys? Yeah, I, yeah. So I, what I see is like um, bringing, because you can directly improve certain things with those approaches, bringing those aspects into organization and government. So in the governmental context, I see it in low risks uh, like environments. So what we usually see in rural areas is that, uh, for example, local uh, communities would like to be better in listening to the needs to their communities of their communities. So establishing feedback ways there for signaling is heavily um, is, is very helpful for the local governments to make better decisions. Uh, but the difficulty is at the same time, especially with governments and also traditional organizations, is like, do they even see the need for it? 
So with governments, we don't see a lot of organizations which are willing to experiment with it uh, because they are too too conservative. Um, uh, while because it's not mature enough, you know. Um, while in organizations, especially if you have agile teams, there's there's room for play, right? There's room for speaking with managers which are open for those methods anyway to try to crowdsource issues in bigger projects, especially to reduce risks. That's the first step. And that's like the, 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 the sale I was always trying to do. But at the same time, we need to mature uh, the research and the frameworks which are uh, available to you put this into, into code um, to allow for easier adoption in those contexts. Yeah, this is very much a, uh, like a standardization problem because you're trying to convince big institutional groups and lots of them to essentially um, do things a very specific way. And so they got to buy into it. They got to say, oh, we agree with the way this is designed. We agree with the data standard. We agree with the, the process. Uh, um, I, I, I learned that lesson a couple years ago. I, launched an ICO and we were trying to do insurance and yeah. uh, we built interesting proofs of concept, but uh, insurance is such a powerful group. As soon as yeah. they found out what we were doing, they couldn't hang up the phone quick enough. Like, you know, <laughs> it was, you need yeah. so many partners to get in and like make something real, make something big. And I think yeah. it gotta be the same with government. So it's good that you can go find where they need the most help and uh, try and, you know, get wins there. The, the, actually, I don't believe that this will be the path of success. I just wrote another comment, outperforming competition through collaboration. I think it's building organizations which are based on those principles which just smash other organizations. And we yeah. see uh, like, for example, Elon Musk's company SpaceX is working with agile approaches from software development as to why, how they develop their spaceship. That's the reason why they test like spaceships, like six spaceships, uh, like prototypes while uh, Boeing is building one, right? So this, is, this, is, this will be the reason why it's successful. It's not because it's, it's nice or because it's better, because you mm -hmm. get to better results if you're able to identify or, like uh, groups which can collaborate with those frameworks. And there's a lot of teaching involved with that. Um, but maybe just for the time being, and also being mindful that we are missing another talk or other talks right now, uh, Chris and uh, Vinny, uh, uh, Vienna, 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 sorry if I say your name wrong. Um, maybe we could jump on a Zoom call uh, later um, or a separate time and just have a chat uh, with a little bit more time to unpack um, and see what comes out of it or just having a purely informational, whatever you, you feel like. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Cool. Um, are you also going to be doing the AI and cybernetics session? Is this the next one which comes up directly uh, like at 12? I, I would love to because the AI and cybernetics, those topics obviously, um, like I see AI as assistance systems, absolutely critical. And cybernetics is, is in a form like what I'm speaking about as well. It's like, uh, informatic systems and uh, compact systems, varying them. There's a long heritage which which I was uh, for a long time also ignorant about. Um, so there are a lot of like because it's a, it's a field which is intersecting with so many other fields: biology, uh, neural like uh, networks, AI, um, like um, psychology, uh, behavioral psych psychology, uh, distributed systems. It's like it's like such a complex field. Um, that is very difficult to cover all the different areas and the best way is really to bring together experts from the different areas and to try to uh, help each other to understand concepts which are underlying to what we observe in the different areas. Yeah, I am definitely in for some kind of study group. Like, in fact, um, I also um, work with the Stanford like um, Codex people. I don't know if you guys have heard um, that people who are looking to um, legal informatics um, and they have tried um, to do things like, you know, establishing some kind of legal primitives. And um, there are people there who are interested in complex systems as well. And it just seems like there's a lot of people trying different approaches. Um, I'm curious about like 
<laughs> how to hack it all together. So, yep, definitely. Yeah, yeah they yeah. made a community. What's the best way, uh, Chris? And um, uh, if you two reach out via email or whoever wants to join this kind of uh, ex explorational uh, exchange of thoughts, uh, I would I would propose just reach out via email, uh, and I will uh, set up a Google uh, a doodle to find a good time for us to jump on a call. Absolutely. Uh, I'm just, a, I guess, a, a precursor to that. I'm looking at money systems and kind of trying to figure out uh, money systems as a as a governing prim primitive. Like it's a thing. It's real power. Money power is real power. It is. So yeah, and, it, and like it, how does yeah. how does that factor in? Yeah, this is very important. Like I see money systems, especially traditionally, was one of the first distributed coordination mechanism which will which work globally. Unfortunately, it cannot capture sufficient complexity. So that's a that's a that's a shortcoming of it, right? But I, I see I see that we could use money uh, and combine it with a form of attention and engagement, which means like you permanently crowdfund actually the things you're engaging with. So you don't need that decision making step as an explicit step. You could have it as a um, you measure pretty much engagement, and uh, this leads to decisions. So there is a way that you could, for example, divide all tax income to everybody who's engaging in the system, and where they put their attention and what they believe is important. This is where you funnel your money to, right? So you can do continuous funding flows. Uh, which are absolutely dynamic, uh, and with it reduce risks of funding the wrong thing or unrelevant thing, because you have the opportunity to revoke support at any time. And projects need to uh, keep their support up to continue, right? So I see that there's a great way with cryptocurrencies to uh, uh, obviously create different value flow systems, uh, which are directly uh, coupled with the organizational forms um, and uh, those distributed forms of work. Exactly. Yeah. And and to, go ahead. Don't, um, so to add on to that, um, maybe this might be helpful. Um, so at the Stanford Zero Degree Project, um, we tried to uh, also model temperature of capital into money, like meaning like money um, is not, it's associated with a temperature, like uh, just to, just to introduce um, like what you said about that money absolutely has power and but also introducing different levers of power in a sense of like well if it came from previous um, source of power then it's a very uh, is a source of power that's very heating to the planet um, but if you have um, some kind of innovation that can prove that you can actually cool down the temperature of your money then you have a new source of power that is um, cooling um, the planet exactly i think that's what i mean when i say money power real power it's like uh it's a little bit like a game where you're just saying okay this loop uh this four stages loop signaling and um uh, you know you know the, the four stages you identified uh at the end of it, it there's like a judgment did it work or did it not did we improve or did we not at the very end, the reflection step. And that's kind of like, yeah. you know, when you reflect, if it keeps getting worse and worse and worse, and you have no incentive to make the loop better, uh, the system crashes. But if you, if at reflection, you said, no, we did better, uh, you know, the system is going to try and improve if you have a way to encourage that. Like every time you get to reflection, you, you're trying to guarantee you're reflecting and it was a good, if, uh, you're going to be incentivized. So then you just say, every time you get to the reflection step, we reevaluate what the money in this loop is worth. And if you did better, the money value goes up. So anybody involved in that loop is going to like maximize their good effect on the world by trying to maximize the value of their, mm. the, the money in their loop. Whatever yeah, I would, it is. I would love, yeah. I, I, I like I understand that way of thinking, uh, and when we have a longer session, I would love to to challenge you on that as well. But I, I was like I had the same thought, like train, and thought that this might be a, like the best way to do it. I'm not convinced anymore about it, um, but it doesn't mean that it's not massively better than anything we have. Um, so this is like adding context to monetary systems. 
uh, yes. which is absolutely important. The question is, are we oversimplifying? Is, 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 is heat really what we are looking for? Or is it uh, like a preservation of life? You know, like this right. is this is very, very important to ask that question, like what are we optimizing for? Because everything we optimize and incentivize for, we set the wrong incentive parameters and we are interacting with a complex system, we can go terribly wrong. Yeah, which is why I appreciated your reflection point because um, that is such an important part. And uh, like Nora Bateson's work on warm data is also really helpful to have to insert more context, I'm sure you know already, okay. So like what I wanted to dive deeper into is um, how do we insert all of that in um, what I would call like an undirected, directed um, acyclical graph, um, but also have a recursive function um, so that yes. we can continually make reflections. Um, but temperature for me, it's um, a, a sense-making invitation that gets people to start thinking about like, oh, actually, even social factors matters in, um, in that sense-making mechanism. It's not just like a physical um, sensor. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's the reason why I'm so excited about having signaling permissionless, because like reflection and signaling, like I said, you know, that's like just a matter of perspective and what are you referring and referencing to, right? Um, and it's like the question of which level you're operating on. Are you nested below a, like a process or above a process? Because you could use the same process to change the process, right? Which is the nature of adaptive systems, right? So this is, this is where I'm really getting excited. And this is where I see where we made a lot of wrongdoing in the past by thinking very mechanistic, that we think we will get it right. And then we did it, and then there was huge harm created based on our own ignorance and data, which was not available at that time, right? So, so I think, uh, yeah, I'm all down for that. And I think if we work with like those paradigms of complex adaptive systems, uh, with those paradigms of we never really see the full picture, um, then we then we can like allow for those feedback loops to really like work more iteratively, work more agile, which we know like is pretty much the same approach. Um, compared to to making those big decisions with those big risks and this big ignorance involved, right? Um, yeah, I would love to to really like find ways to bring that in into a more practical way. And another thing which I would love to see is actually a distributed governance as a as a field of research, which is acknowledged as a field of research, um, so that we can interconnect all the different research which is done in that area. But there needs to be some form of institutionalization to allow for exchange between those different domains of expertise. And we try to do that with DGOV, but it's a non-funded nonprofit. So it's like it's like hardly sustainable. Um, so we need to find ways to, to really coordinate better to evolve this uh, distributed governance area with like open knowledge um, basis as well, right? So those governance functions and like the signaling and those frameworks, they should be open source so that people could contribute to this knowledge base and help to improve them um, and reference their pilot projects. So this is what I would love to see in that area. And it requires all the different area. It requires academic, uh, governmental, organizational, uh, all these different areas. I send you to an email, so I would love to, to continue with the conversation. Is anybody who joined the room got interested by the topic we were speaking about, uh, feel free to reach out uh, to be added to, to the loop to follow like the conversations uh, we will have as a following up of this gathering. <laughs> um, so this cybernetics is directly after this one here. I didn't check that. Yeah, exactly. Wonderful. Was, okay, then I will. Hmm? I was gonna say, I, I think I'm torn between cybernetics and the uh, smart cast, uh, the agricultural project. So I think I'm gonna go to that one. But cool. it was good to meet you both, and uh, look forward to the next next time we can meet up. Same wise. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. All right, I will have a break and thanks everybody. Thank you.